AM 1420, WBSM presents Spooky South Coast with your hosts, Tim Weisberg and Matt Costa. Good evening and welcome to Spooky South Coast. Tim Weisberg here along with the silent assassin, Matt Costa, and science advisor, Matt Moniz, broadcasting on WBSM and also broadcasting live on Spooky TV at SpookySouthCoast.com. If you go to the website and just click on the Spooky TV link up in the upper left-hand corner, you can watch what's going on in the studio while the show goes on. I don't know why, but people seem to like it. We want to say hi to everybody that's out there in the chat room at Spooky TV as well. Uh, we've got the, the regular crew in there, so if you want to join in the discussion there, it always veers off the main discussion, but still, it, it's it's always extremely interesting. How is that different than our show? That's true, too. <laughs> but it gets to the point where it's almost distracting because I'm trying to follow the conversations that are going on in there and follow the conversations that are on the <laughs> air, and I get questions sent in uh, you know, on my phone, and we get the emails on my phone, so it's like everything's going different ways. So if anybody is ever a guest on the show... And you're watching in Spooky TV and you see me doing a thousand different things. It's not that I'm not paying attention. It's just that I have severe ADD, which comes in handy when you're trying to, you know, do this job. It's it's way harder, too, for Mac Ossa because he's the one that's over there, you know, running everything. And then he has to, like, also be listening for me to give him strange directions from time to time. Like, hey, Matt, how about you pull this up on YouTube? So it's a lot of arm flailing. Like, it is. Ah. That's, and everybody, wa- everybody wonders why... You're not on the camera on Spooky TV, and that's because usually when I ask you for something, you're over there flipping me off, <laughs> and we don't want to. We want to keep this family friendly. So, uh, I like how uh, Low Battery Dave in the chat room said, "I'm the Larry King of the South Coast, uh, without the suspenders. Uh, the only difference or the is, heart attacks. The, the only difference is I haven't been doing the same exact show for the last thirty years. So, no, it just feels like it." Every week is different. Every week is a new discussion. And every week we get to have intriguing discussions about the world of the paranormal, as we will tonight. In hour number one, when we're joined by our guest Richard Salva, he's the author of the new book, The Yoga of Ghost Hunting. And then in hour number two, we're going to talk with Donna LaCroix, formerly of Ghost Hunters and Ghost Hunters International, about something that she has going on, a a cause that's near and dear to her heart that actually doesn't have anything to do with the paranormal. But uh, we're going to discuss that in, in hour number two. And uh, we'll also give you an update on the Dead of Winter event at the Lizzie Board and Bed and Breakfast. There's Matt Costa for Spooky TV. Uh, because tickets are almost gone. Yeah, just bring that back a little more, Moni, so you can be there. There's only nine spots left. All the rooms are gone. We're to the point now where if you don't get your tickets soon, you're going to miss your chance. And uh, if you want to go to uh, ghostvillage.com slash Lizzie, that's the L I Z Z I E. That's the place to get tickets uh, and get the information. You can also call the Lizzie Boyd and Bed and Breakfast as well, and uh, we'll give that number out a little bit later on in the show uh, because we don't want you calling them now and bothering them when they've got stuff going on. So, but only nine spots left. So get involved while you can. All right. Well, let's get right into tonight's first hour discussion. Richard Salva is a 30-year expert on all things related to reincarnation yoga and meditation he became interested in reincarnation and yoga philosophy in his teens when he moved to ananda a yoga community in the sierra nevada foothills for the next 30 plus years he has continued his studies under the guidance of swami uh, kriyananda and a direct disciple of paramhansa yogananda an author and minister richard has given hundreds of lectures on reincarnation yoga philosophy and history in the united states and in europe he is the author of the reincarnation of abraham lincoln and his new book is The Yoga of Ghost Hunting. So please welcome back to the program, Richard Salva. Good evening, Richard. How are you? Hello, Tim. Are you there? Oh, we're here. Oh, good. Well, it's a pleasure to be on your show. Oh, it's great to have you back. And uh, I think I did a little bit better with the pronunciations this time. <laughs> <laughs> They're tough. They're real tongue twisters for sure. Well, uh, but for somebody who has studied this uh, for so many years, for 30-plus years now, uh, I can imagine that the pronunciations just roll off the tongue for you by now. <laughs> yeah, they're, they're pretty easy, but uh, it took a little practice at the beginning, so <laughs> don't feel bad. <laughs> well, it's interesting now because we've talked with you in the past uh, about your book, The Reincarnation of Abraham Lincoln. Yes. And we've talked with you uh, also about the nature of the soul and the nature of uh, you know, human being uh, enlightenment. And w- when I first heard that your new book was called The Yoga of Ghost Hunting, I said, well, you know, that's a perfect fit for Richard, <laughs> knowing your work in the yogi field and also knowing your work in the paranormal field. 
And I did expect when I got the book from you that it was going to be uh, almost like a, a, a how-to manual of how to go through some of these yoga-type exercises almost, these yoga-type uh, both mind and body movements to kind of center yourself before go something. I didn't expect that it was going to have what I think are some really intriguing uh, philosophies for people who are interested in the paranormal. Mm. Yes, but there are also a goodly number of tips and techniques in there uh, that I think will come in handy for people who like to go ghost hunting. And, and I will definitely be doing some of those myself uh, the next time that I go out because I'm somebody that runs into things and kind of goes in headstrong and you know doesn't really think about centering myself or think about where I am as a person. And it always worked for me. But now after reading this, I've kind of taken this a step back and had second thoughts maybe about some of my approaches. Mm. Well, it's interesting. Uh, you know, when we go to a haunted house, uh, it's interesting just to have the understanding of what exactly has gone on in that place for a period of time. Because uh, something that Yogananda said, uh, he, he got his name pretty close. His name is Yogananda. He wrote Autobiography of a Yogi, uh, which has uh, been read by millions throughout the world, including the Beatles and Elvis Presley, and has inspired many people. Uh, one of the things that he wrote in that book, this great world teacher, was that thoughts are universally rooted. And what that means is anywhere you are, uh, if you could think of uh, any sort of wavelength of thought, uh, the very wide spectrum of human thought is different radio stations. And that uh, our minds are like radio uh, receivers. And uh, depending on our consciousness and what we're tuning into, we can tune into any sort of flow of thought at any period of time. But when you go into a haunted house, that's a place where a soul has been stuck there perhaps for decades, perhaps for hundreds or even thousands of years. And usually these people are not in a good mood. <laughs> <laughs> I have a friend who is a, sort of a ghost hunter, but he's somebody who actually sees ghosts and has helped them to transition to the other side. And he said, uh, you know, most of these people are not people you'd want to hang out with normally. Uh, there's if you see somebody who's really in a bad mood or walking down the street, that's what you often run into when you run into ghosts because they're usually stuck there for a reason. Uh, something happened to them. Uh, they got into a frame of mind where they just feel like maybe something uh, really bad was done to them. And uh, what happens when you have somebody thinking that way, uh, it, it sort of creates a very loud... Uh, sound that uh, if you if you have a radio and you know you have one station that's really got a really big antenna and maybe like your station <laughs> and then, <laughs> no uh, not at all <laughs> or maybe you're trying to reach your station but there's another station that has this you know really loud uh, rap music on it and you can't quite hear the station you want to reach because that other station is so loud and so when you go into a haunted house uh, somebody there has really tuned into a certain thought form for a really long period of time and what that does is it creates a sort of a whirlpool of energy that can pull you into it. And so we do, it is a good idea if you're going to go ghost hunting to have some sort of psychic protection, something that will help you to uh, strengthen your consciousness. And just for your listeners now, I'll give them one technique, which I believe I share in the book also. Uh, for us who are yogis, uh, as you mentioned, I've been practicing uh, and studying the teachings of yogis, Yogananda's teachings, for about 35 years now. And uh, there are certain techniques that are taught for strengthening the mind and the consciousness, and this is one of them. Before you go on a ghost hunt, uh, sit down in a chair somewhere in your home and just sort of clear your mind of all thoughts of the day. And then uh, place your mind very strongly. Well, it would be good to actually beforehand to do uh, just some deep breathing, to inhale, perhaps to a count of six, to hold for a count of six, and exhale to the same count. You can breathe in through the nose and out through the nose and mouth. And this uh, rhythmic breathing helps to calm ourselves. You were talking about yoga techniques. There's another one. After you do this rhythmic breathing, just sit in the silence for a while and place your mind at the point midway between the eyebrows and the forehead. Uh, this is the where the... Um, Higher aspects of the brain are located, the frontal lobe of the brain, uh, higher reasoning. It's also the center of willpower in the body. And uh, basically what, what happens when you go into a haunted house, uh, if you feel your uh, mood affected by it, is that you're dealing with a struggle of will. 
and you just have to have a stronger will about placing your mind where it wants to go. And so putting your mind at the point between the eyebrows will help you to guard yourself from someone else's thoughts, mm-hmm. to center yourself in your own consciousness. The other, another good thing about going in groups to haunted houses is there is a protection there, because usually groups that go are excited, they're happy, they're having a good time, and you're all sort of tuning into that form together, right? And uh, when, you, when you do that, that also creates, creates its own protection. But uh, when, when you're on a ghost hunt, if you've forgotten to do this technique beforehand, you could still do it while you're on the hunt. Just put your mind very strongly at the point between the eyebrows and think a happy thought, like Harry Potter, you know, <laughs> dealing with those, those creatures who would suck out your soul, you know, thinking of a positive thought. Think of something positive, think of something happy and joyful. And uh, you can be tuning into something really happy no matter what's going on around you. Well, one of the things that I noticed uh, in the book when you're describing some of these tips and techniques you can go through uh, prior to an investigation is something that I do uh, when I'm on an investigation and I didn't really realize the meditative connectiveness with it. Um, When I go into a room for the first time or if if I'm off by myself, while people are in other parts of the house, I just like to go into a room, and I call it getting the vibe of the room. Mm. I call it just, and I do exactly almost as you describe in the book, of standing there with my arms out and my eyes closed and trying to keep that straight line. But when I'm doing it, I'm not doing it to center myself, as you suggest in the book. I'm doing it to see if anything kind of pulls me or moves me around. Yes. And it it just seems strange that it's something that is just intuitive in me Mm. to do that, and it turns out that it actually is part of this philosophy. Well, it's like what you say, uh, when you close your eyes, uh, it's like being a ghost, because the ghosts uh, live in a universe that is behind the physical universe. This is something Yogananda talks about in his autobiography, The Yogi. Uh, His spiritual teacher, a guru, whose name was Sri Uteshwar, uh, passed away and then actually came back and physically manifested himself and told Yogananda all about the astral world. And it's a fascinating chapter called The Resurrection of Sri Uteshwar. But uh, he talks about this astral universe that is behind the physical universe. It's a subtler uh, universe. You know, um, scientists aren't able to uh, quantify 98% of the matter in the universe, and they call it dark matter, and they also connect it with something called dark energy. And, uh, you know, and uh, what what yogis would say is that what they're talking about is actually the energy coming from the astral world into the physical universe. And the astral universe is actually much larger than the physical universe. It's like a really large helium balloon, uh, hot air balloon, over the little basket of the physical universe. The physical universe is incredibly vast. It's almost inconceivably vast. Billions of galaxies with billions of stars in each one, and and, uh, it would take us, you know, thousands of years to get to the next star, you know, at their fastest speed. So it's a pretty big place, but the astral universe is much larger. And it interconnects with the physical universe right behind it. And this is the universe that ghosts live in. They live in an energy world. And that's why it's, you, when, even when you see uh, a ghost, when you can see the image of a ghost, sometimes it's not completely there. There's so much in the energy world that it's sometimes hard for them to maintain a clear physical uh, manifestation of the, the full body. But, uh, you know, when you close your eyes, and you, you can, some of our listeners, if you're listening on the radio, you could just stand in your room and close your eyes and just move your arms a little bit, and you could just feel the energy that is moving your arms. And uh, maybe walk a few steps forward and backward. This energy that you feel is behind your physical body because we are energy beings before we are physical beings. And we're actually more in touch with that astral world than we are with this physical world. That's why we, most of us need to sleep at night, and we have real problems if we don't, because we have to go back into that energy world and recharge ourselves, and uh, that's something that we do through sleep. But the sleep world is the same world that uh, the, uh, the uh, ghosts inhabit. Well, what was interesting to me, too, is uh, you mentioned in the book that Yogananda's teachings uh, suggest that we are ghosts ourselves. Yes, that's right. <laughs> Yes, in a very in a very real sense, because at night we are ghosts, and uh, we were very aware, of, you know, of how well we sleep. We're very awake at night. Most of the time, then we're ghosts, and uh, uh, we're we're you know we're only on the physical world for a very short period of time, and then we return 
uh, back to that energy world. So to quote Sting, we are spirits in the material world. Mm, yes, exactly. And uh, with, with this idea of us being able to achieve that astral uh, astral plane, the astral connection in our sleep, um, I'm assuming that with these techniques that you talk about in the book, uh, in these meditative states, that you're able to slip into that uh, in some degree with meditation. I mean, I'm assuming it must take many years of practice to get to that point. But can we slip into that astral plane uh, while, during our waking hours? Uh, yes, absolutely. And uh, actually, you know, when we daydream, we're sort of half in that, that plane already. But to, to consciously go into that plane, to be able to uh, traverse it, to be able to see everything that is going on, yes, that takes a, a heightened degree of awareness that can come, when, especially when we learn to meditate. You know, I tell for many people they would like to be able to know more about the ghosts that they're going to see on ghost hunts. And the best way to do that is to meditate, because in meditation you realize that you are more than just a physical body. You know, we're so sort of mesmerized by the movie of the physical world around us. It, it's changing all the time, but it changes very slowly. So we don't notice it as much. If we, if we come back to a place we used to live and we see, oh, look at all these changes, but the people who live there, it happens so slowly they hardly, hardly notice. And it's sort of like, uh, it's like a, a hypnosis that we're under. But, but uh, in meditation, when you stop you know, the physical body moving and you, you hold very still, after a while, you start to become aware of the energy in the body. And then you have to learn how to direct that energy and control it. And awareness precedes control. But once you have control of that energy, then you can direct also your consciousness because the energy goes where your mind goes, where your thoughts go. See, one of the things that I've always had a problem with myself, uh, and I get into a debate with this with a lot of my friends in the field because I have friends who claim that they can actually help spirits move on. And... I think that that's kind of a risky claim uh, unless you can really know for sure and see it with your own eyes or, or however you want to have that verification. You know, you're taking a big risk telling a client, a homeowner maybe, that you're helping that spirit move on. But through what you describe uh, and the techniques that you talk about with, uh, with, with bringing forth the light, it sounds like it's the, the most definitive way to move a spirit on. Or help yeah. move on. Yes, it really helps to be able to, to see what you're doing and to, to have that uh, degree of uh, awakened awareness within yourself that you can actually see the spirits. In my book, I actually mentioned when I was writing that other book of mine, The Reincarnation of Abraham Lincoln, I was actually, during a, large, uh, a good portion of that work, living in a haunted house. And uh, I'll, I'll just tell the story very briefly here. Uh, I had just moved into a townhouse with uh, my wife, and uh, we just noticed some strange things. I would hear my wife walking down the steps to come see me, and uh, I'd be there in the kitchen, and this thought popped into my mind. You know, maybe I was just tuning into what was going on, but it was like, wouldn't it be funny if I turned my head around the corner and she wasn't there? And I just laughed at myself because I'd heard her very clearly coming down the steps. But just, uh, just still laughing at myself, I put my head around the corner, and there was no one there. And uh, we started to have these strange experiences there. So we asked a friend of ours who we knew ha had this ability to, to see spirits and had helped uh, some of them to transition in a very clear way where there was no question about whether it had happened or not. And he came to our house, and uh, he walked around for a bit, and he said, yes, you definitely have a problem. He had felt uh, cold air in the upstairs in one of our rooms, actually in the master bedroom, Yikes. <laughs> and, <laughs> so, and also downstairs in another area, he said there were two different locations. He recommended a few things, which I also mentioned in the book, uh, things like putting up uh, crucifixes, uh, putting salt around the bed that we slept in. We slept in the smaller room after that for a little while. And uh, he said that he would, he would work on it, but he had to go away for a while and wouldn't be able to come back to do it for a little bit. So we had... To, I basically hung out in that house with these ghosts for a while because I was living at home working on my book. I had taken a hiatus from work. And uh, so I just hung out with them. And every now and then I would feel their presence. I would just feel like there was somebody there. And I could feel maybe a little bit of a cool air there and a little bit of a sense of somebody being there. And uh, I did what I think uh, any yogi would do, which was I knew that these were souls who were stuck in the physical plane against their will, if they really had uh, freedom to do whatever they'd want to do, they would be out of there. But 
uh, they were attached there for one reason or another. You can call it karma, you can call it uh, delusion, you can call it whatever you want, but I felt for them because, you know, it could have been me for some reason, something happening to me. And I had no idea what their situation exactly was, but I just felt for them. So uh, I just sent them energy. This is, have you ever, most of you have probably seen the original version of uh, Karate Kid. Oh, yeah. Where it was in Ralph Morita, is that his name, who played the uh, Japanese guru? Uh, oh, yeah, Pat, Pat Morita? Pat Morita, that's it. Yeah, he's a great actor. Uh, he did this thing where he'd smack his hands together and then rub his hands together to do a healing on uh, on that uh, that uh, young fellow's leg and so on. Uh, that's kind of like the technique that the yogis teach, where you rub your hands together and feel the energy in your hands. And then you raise your hands up, and then you just send that energy out. And it's just a very simple thing that you can do, and uh, just to send your goodwill to these spirits. And every time I'd feel their presence, I would just say to them, go into the light, be free. You're not in your physical body anymore. I know it seems like it is, but you're not. And uh, just I, I wish them well every time I felt their presence. And after a few weeks of this, finally the, the, our friend was able to come to do a transitioning. And uh, so we, my wife and I left for the uh, night and the evening, and we came back. And the place was very, felt very different. Uh, first of all, when we came in, all the crucifixes were on the floor, and we thought that was very weird. And uh, so, and but it felt very different. So we we found our friend and we asked him what had happened. He said, when he got there, he sat down downstairs where he'd felt the cold air, and he was sitting, sat there very quietly as he was. He's also a yogi, a meditator. And suddenly, at one point, he just saw in front of him, sitting in front of him, he did this at twilight, which he says is a good time for connecting with spirits, because it's a time in between the day and the night, and it's sort of like that halfway, uh, you, you know, there's, there's, a, there's like a doorway there for connecting with the astral world. And uh, he said that uh, a Native American man was sitting in front of him, and he looked very angry, and his face was actually covered in blood. And uh, he said something like, to the effect of death to the Christos. And this was in the San Francisco Bay Area. And apparently what had happened was this man was a Native American who lived in the Bay Area at the time when the Spanish missionaries were coming through. And somehow he had run afoul of the missionaries and or them and their soldiers, and he had been killed. And uh, so he, his, out of hatred for them, he was stuck in this place. Some part of his spirit was stuck in it, and uh, so um, now th my my friend who was trying to help this soul transition to the other side was was struck by a temptation at that point because in college he had done papers on the Plains Indians and their beliefs in the after afterlife, and this thought came into his mind: Oh, I could use some of that imagery, and he immediately pushed it out of his mind because he realized these. These Native Americans have no idea what that imagery is all about. And it would just be an imposition on them to try to push it on them. And so, like all good ghost hunters should do, he just cleared his mind and tried to be open to what their situation was, what their experience was, so that he could really know what was going on here and really experience in clarity for himself as well as for this, this stuck soul. And uh, when he did that, uh, he asked the spirit, you know, well, what's your impression of the afterlife or what is what happens after you die, and the spirit told him. And using the imagery that the spirit told me, he was able to help the spirit understand that he had left his physical body, and that it was time for him to move on. He was able to help him transition. Then our friend went upstairs, and he found another spirit up there in the master bedroom, and this was the son of the man who had died down below. He had also died, and he was also stuck in the same location uh, with his father. And uh, he had come on a horse for some reason. <laughs> <laughs> and my friend who did the transition said he didn't know what happened with the horse. It just sort of disappeared after the transitioning. But, when you know, <laughs> you know, when I came back there, my wife and I both felt it was like night and day. I mean, the feeling there was so different. Before, there was just this feeling of emotional tension in the whole house that uh, she and I just struggled to, you know, keep a calm energy and, you know, in spite of that. Uh, it was just something we had to sort of fight against a little bit. And then, um, but after the transitioning, it was just so beautiful there. It was just like a, a breath of fresh air, like the, the spring coming up after winter. You know, all those analogies hold for that sort of experience. And, you know, I had an interesting experience myself 
uh, just a day or two after the transitioning took place. My wife and I were just taking a nap uh, in our master bedroom, and I was looking up, uh, and I was about to fall asleep, and right before I fell asleep, I saw floating in the air above me uh, a man and a woman who looked like they could be a combination of Native American and Latino. And uh, they were looking down at me and just smiling with a lot of love. And then they just sort of disappeared. And it was like I had this feel, real sense that someone had just sent me a real, you know, like a goodwill wish or a blessing of some sort. And I mentioned it to the man who did the transitioning, and he thought that maybe these uh, were uh, the descendants uh, somehow through some sort of connection in genealogy and, and their lineage uh, to these spirits. And since I had spent so much time with them and had wished them nothing but goodwill, uh, they were just wanting to show their appreciation of it to me. But, you know, even now I still consider those spirits to be my friends. And, and yeah. What's interesting, too, about that is, you know, you kind of had that sense of something wasn't quite right in the house. And even though, you know, you're probably a, a better meditator than anyone I've ever spoken to and you can achieve a, a greater awareness than most people I know, even then they didn't necessarily make themselves known to you. And it was kind of through your friend that the, that you found out about them. It, it seems interesting that uh, what, no matter what wavelength you can get yourself to, sometimes the spirits still find a way to... Uh, maybe not make it to you or maybe avoid you in some some cases? Yes, uh, I think they are aware of those who uh, have the sensitivity to be able to tune into them. And uh, I think perhaps I had spoken to other people who had lived in that same apartment, uh, and uh, some of them had also practiced meditation. And they said, yes, you know, now that you mention, I do remember some strange, ex slightly strange experiences there, but they just they just never paid attention to it. Mm -hmm. And I think the fact that I was there so much of the time, you know, it could have been if I'd uh, just not taken that time off work and wasn't at home as often, that I might not have noticed it as much. But being there all the time, uh, it just became very clear to me that something was going on here. Well, one of the things that I also found interesting was when you're discussing the idea of of letting the light kind of facilitate through you and helping these spirits move on. You mentioned the need to kind of pull yourself away from uh, that experience to, to get rid of your own ego and to get rid of your own sense of self and just be part of that greater enlightenment. And I think that overall, that's a, a good approach to take to paranormal investigating to, to not have it be about the experience that's happening to you, but to have it be about the interaction between, uh, the living and, and the dead and to, you know, to not make it be, uh, I want to see this. I want you to do this, do this to me and kind of just make yourself part of, uh, this greater gateway that a haunted location is. Yes, I agree completely. I think that's a, that's a much better approach, and I think uh, the more that we would uh, take that sort of approach, I think the better experiences we would have as well. Is there uh, are there any techniques that you've tried to use on a on a ghost hunt th that have backfired on you? Has there <laughs> any instances where you know getting into that state kind of didn't pay off well? Uh, no, no, I never have. Uh, I think uh, there are varying uh, degrees of uh, success that I've had. But see, part of it, too, is that I didn't become aware of ghosts as much. I didn't have as many experiences of them until I had sort of been uh, meditating for a period of time. And uh, I, I mean, I, I think there are spirits around us all the time, no matter where we are. I mean, if the astral world interconnects, intersects with the physical world, uh, completely, then there must be astral beings just sort of floating by even while we're talking here, you know, on the radio <laughs> in your, you know, we're in your studio there and here in my home and wherever we happen to be, there are astral beings all the time, but some of them we're just more aware of than, uh, than others, and those that are really kind of stuck in the location, uh, see, the thing is that something that Sri Yukteswar said when he, when he came back and spoke with Yogananda about these things, he said that those uh, spirits who are really highly uh, developed spiritually, uh, they have greater freedom in the astral world. And those that are not as developed don't have as great of a freedom. And I think those that are, are stuck in the physical world, because of their attachment to the physical world, uh, that they're not tuning into the highest that is uh, within them. And because of that, uh, that's why they're stuck. And uh, so... 
once you uh, are developing spiritually, then you have a greater freedom than uh, those souls that are, are not as developed spiritually, and you can actually help them along and help them forward. And that's, uh, I think, what tr real transitioning is all about. And is there any concern with being more open of the, the negative entities that can be involved in some of these cases, what some people might call demonic, or even what just might be a, a bad human ghost, as we alluded to earlier, is it possible that being in that state allows them to kind of invade on you a little bit? You know, uh, that's a good point, and I think I've mentioned that also in the book, Tim, but uh, the thing that happens, we had talked about how a ghost will stay in a location for a long period of time, mm -hmm. and they'll create this whirlpool of a certain negative thought that can make it easier for the mental radio stations of other people that go into that building or room or whatever to tune into that thought. Um, but what also happens is if you, if you really tune into a thought very deeply, whether it's positive or negative, at some point you can draw on uh, in, in a being in the universe that's so in deeply into that thought that they're like a manifestation of it. And uh, so I think this is what happens in these places where they have things like poltergeists or they have um, these sort of negative uh, experiences that aren't really ghosts. There's something different from ghosts, and there's something that, if you want to put it that way, worse than ghosts. Uh, is that uh, either, you know, through whatever has happened there, it has drawn uh, an entity there that is in tune with a negative experience, in tune with uh, a negative thought form there, and is like a manifestation of it. And if you ever run into something like that, uh, just as martial artists would say, if somebody comes and pick a fight, the best thing you could do is to walk away. The same thing with uh, encountering something like that, because there's, little good that can come from exposing yourself for any long period of time to a really toxic psychic um, experience like that. I mean, there can be a, a quick thrill and, and a very short experience of it, but I, I wouldn't recommend it, especially on a regular basis. When you uh, started studying the philosophies uh, of meditation and started uh, following the works of Yogananda, was there a period for you where you had kind of a, a skepticism about these about these approaches? Uh, did you ever feel, because I know a lot of the ghost hunters and the paranormal investigators that are listening are very hardcore science, and anything spiritual they kind of turn a screwy eye to. Uh, was there a skepticism for you and then kind of an aha moment that happened in, in, in the course of your development? Well, I became interested in uh, yoga and meditation at a very young age, and I found it all quite fascinating. And also, when I was reading uh, the works of Yogananda, I had a very strong sense of just um, how, how uh, what he was saying just felt really true to me in a very deep way. And there's a, a number of things like you were talking about that I just had to sort of say, well, I don't have experiences of those things. I believe that he knows what he's talking about. I'll just have to put that on the shelf until I actually have an experience like that myself or I, I mm -hmm. come across that. And so you do that, you know, with a number of things. But I found as I continue along that pretty much everything he said is, has come out to be true, So, uh, at least from my experience of it. And I've, I have had experiences with ghosts. I have had experiences with spirits. I've even had uh, some experiences with, with uh, negative entities. I actually told a story in the book about uh, once when I was uh, at Ananda Village, which is in Northern California, it's a spiritual community. Even at places like this, sometimes something things like this can come up uh, very rarely, uh, even much more rarely than in the out, uh, other areas, but uh, uh, still sometimes. And there was a woman who attended a, uh, a spiritual retreat there, and uh, she was pregnant, and she was staying in her van, which is parked on the land near this little kind of uh, uh, cove there, a little area there. And uh, so uh, she came to me at one point because I was working in the program there. Uh, and uh, she said, I have a problem because uh, I'm trying to sleep at night and uh, I feel that there's something that, that comes and I can hear something walking outside the van, but I look out the windows and I don't see anything. And then so the van will start shaking, and the child in my womb would just start kicking like crazy. And she said, well, what can we do about this? And I said, well, why don't uh, we, uh, you know, we can swap where we're going to stay tonight. You can stay in my room here while I go and stay where your van is. And so I pitched a tent right out there where her van was. 
And I spent the night there, and I tried some of these techniques of sending light out into the little meadow there where it was it all taken place. And uh, then uh, I went to sleep, and in the middle of the night I woke up, and I felt that there was something out there. Uh, and uh, so I just continued to send light. And like you said, I wasn't thinking of myself. I was just thinking of the light that I felt from Yogananda. Sometimes you can think of an advanced soul. You can think of Christ or Buddha or whoever you feel a connection with that way, uh, St. Francis, anybody that you feel that sort of connection with, and just send that light out uh, through them and through you because they're just acting as channels for that light too. And uh, so I did that for a while, and I, I wished if it were a soul that was in torment that they would be at peace, and I wished if it was just a, a totally dark thing that it would go away. And uh, so I did that for a while, and after a while I just felt this peace sort of descend on me in the tent and also just on the meadow there, and I went back to sleep and I was in trouble again. And then uh, the woman went back out there, and, and it was gone. It didn't trouble her again. It had been doing it for several nights in a row, and now it was gone. But uh, if, if, if you, we can all do that, though. We can all sort of send light out anytime we want to just by thinking it. Uh, think energy, think light out. If you're ever in that situation, just you know, do that. Uh, the more you do it, the stronger you'll become. Just like anybody who's trying to build a muscle, you know, you just have to keep, uh, you know, lifting weights to build a muscle. The more that you send light out, the more that you're able to send out. Uh, but if you can run into a really, you know, really dark and really negative thing, uh, unless you really feel sure that you can do something about it, I would just say. You know, leave it be and, and walk the other way. Well, we are talking with Richard Salva. He is an expert in reincarnation and yoga philosophy. His new book is The Yoga of Ghost Hunting, and it's available on his website, Christar Press. That's yes. C-R-Y-S-T-A-R Press dot com. And, it's and actually, Tim, I just wanted to interject real quick. Uh, sure. the, the easy way to get uh, to the page for that book is... Uh, to go to yogaghost.com. <laughs> oh, can't get any simpler than that. Yeah, really. <laughs> and it's linked up on SpookySouthCoast.com as well. And if you have any questions, uh, you can give us a call, 508-996-0500 or 1-877-996-1420. You can also email us, SpookyCrew at SpookySouthCoast.com, or you can jump in the chat room on Spooky TV. And Low Battery Dave in the chat room had a question, uh, Richard, about the idea of residual haunts. Uh, this just this recorded energy that's held within a location, the idea of that and time slips, which is kind of like a parallel theory to that of where you're kind of glimpsing into an alternate time. Uh, how do these relate to uh, what what you're talking about? Well, I think uh, time slips is something entirely. Uh, it's, it's another experience. It's another paranormal experience, and uh, the on on a very high level of consciousness, you can actually experience all time happening at the same time. But uh, for us, you know, here where we are, we, we really have to kind of work on a, on a linear <laughs> chronological basis. Uh, but occasionally, sometimes people will have these experiences where they'll slip into another time. Uh, I read about, uh, I think it was a man or a woman who had gone to Gettysburg, Pennsylvania, and he was in an elevator in an old building that had been a military hospital during the Gettysburg uh, battle during the Civil War. And uh, he, he hit the button to go down to his floor, and they, the elevator kept ascending all the way to the basement. He kept trying to hit the buttons, and when the doors opened, he looked out and he saw a scene from the Civil War with uh, doctors, you know, so-called doctors in those days, they were doing the best they knew how, but they were chopping off limbs, and, you know, that's where they had these big carts of limbs and things like that. And, and it was a really horrible experience. And... Uh, while he was looking, one of the patients actually looked up and it was as if he could see him. And he's pushing the button, trying to close the door really you know, drastically, and finally he got the thing to close. It was a really freaky experience for him. But uh, sometimes these time slips happen, whether somebody has a karmic connection with that time period and needs to be reminded of it for some reason. Uh, I mean, our, our spirits are so much more than what we think of when we think of ourselves. You know, this, this personality that we put on, I talk about this when we talk about reincarnation, it's just, it's just one little aspect of who and what we are. And we just play this role for a while so that we can learn certain lessons in this lifetime, but we've also lived in other lives. So I think a lot of the time slips have to do uh, with reincarnation. 
But uh, what was that other thing you were talking about, residual haunting? Yeah, well, the idea, it's like a recorded energy within a location. So, you know, you kind of see, it's along the same line almost as a time slip. If you're seeing the same phenomena play out at the same time on the same date, or what you're seeing is, uh, it can't interact with you. You know, it's almost like you're watching a movie before your eyes, uh, but, it's, it, but it's paranormal activity. Mm-hmm. Yes, yes that's, uh, that's really interesting. Uh, would that happen to be connected with the experiences of people who, for instance, uh, hear the sounds of a battle that took place 100 years ago on that same yeah, night? And I, I think it's exactly along the same lines. It's just yes. it's a residual energy that is in a place. Right, right. You know, uh, our, you know, they talk about crystals and how it might be possible for people in uh, higher ages to be able to put their thoughts into a crystal, and if you were in tune with it, that you could then tune into those those thoughts. And uh, I think sometimes some parts of the earth are like a crystal. Uh, I know when I went to England years ago, uh, I experienced things there that were just like they had just happened, but they had happened like hundreds of years ago. I think I may have mentioned in another interview that I had on, on your show how I had an experience uh, where the, the uh, Battle of Hastings took place. Mm-hmm. And it was just like I was watching the battle in front of my eyes, just sort of superimposed on the landscape. And I was weeping because I, I was feeling uh, as myself in the battle, having experienced it and what I went through there. But sometimes it just seems like, and I think in England that's especially true, where some of these places, you know, like places that time forgot, where nothing has really changed for hundreds of years, and uh, things are just sort of get stuck there, and it's like an uh, endless loop tape. And uh, that can take place, especially when something dramatic happens, where people, lose, uh, many people leave their bodies at the same time in a very dramatic way, in a very way that, that leaves them confused or emotional. Uh, something like that can get stuck as a, sort of like a recording in the earth itself, if you know what I mean. Mm-hmm. And uh, so, yeah, that, I, I think that's, that's what my understanding is of those uh, experiences. Well, and... Somebody else brought up in the chat room, too, and this is something that I know uh, we've discussed with you in the past, but how come when you're talking about past lives, it always seems like somebody was somebody famous in a past <laughs> life? You know, nobody ever remembers. I mean, I know it does happen, but you uh-huh. hear more stories about people being, as, as they pointed out in the chat room, George Washington or right. Cleopatra instead of being a farmhand. Yeah. Well, you know, a number of people uh, had been told that they had been uh, Mary Queen of Scots in a past life, and... Uh, these women, uh, Yogananda asked them all together in the same room, and he said, well, the real Mary Queen of Scots, please stand up, you know, and got them all to just sort of laugh about it. I think what happens sometimes, you know, when we go to psychics and they say you were so-and-so in a past life, it may not mean that you were that person, but maybe that you lived in the era when that person was alive. Because, you know, just as we now, you know, we tend to sometimes identify with uh, really well-known people that everybody in the world knows about right now, whether it's a political figure, uh, somebody who's famous for just being famous, as we tend to be nowadays. Um, you know, but if you lived in the time of Mary Queen of Scots, maybe you just felt a connection with her, you know, if you were uh, one of the people who lived in the country where she was, you know. Uh, and, and so just by tuning into that famous person, because there's so many people who lived and died, very little record of what their lives were about, but if you can read about somebody who had been alive that everyone knew about, there's a lot more information about them. Uh, there will be a lot of overlap, too, with your own experience. So I think some of it is that, and uh, some of it is just that, that uh, well, you know, we tend to think that we would like to have been somebody big and famous, you know. Uh, if we've lived in a past life, maybe we're some great hero or... Uh, I'm a yogi, I'm a spiritual person, so I thought maybe I'd be some great saint, and then I realized that I was a farmer, and this and that. And, you know, these real, uh, there's one, there's one person who is a farmer. Yeah, I went real prosaic. But you know, the people who do past life regressions say that uh, the, the um, percentages of those people who leave, lead pretty normal pedestrian lives, as most of us do, and those who live really famous lives, are pretty much uh, these the same as what is true historically, from what their experiences of doing past life regressions. You know, very few of the people that were really well known, and usually there's some of the more you know lesser known, well known people. But you know, for for any of us, if we think that we were some great 
person in past life, we have to ask ourselves, could we do what they had done? You know, because if you had been that person in past life, then you would have to be able to manifest a comparable energy in this lifetime, because if you were able to do that then, you should be able to do something similar now. And whether you're famous or not, you would just have to have that, that sort of consciousness, and that sort of energy. Somebody who thinks that they were Napoleon would have to be, have the same energy to, to come out of exile and appear at the gates of this, this, this town with all, everybody pointing their guns at you and say, I'm your emperor, open up. And all they, one person just one shot and you would have been dead. And instead they, they, they put their guns down and said, uh, yes, your excellency, or whatever, and open the gates just because of the power of his personality. Somebody would have to have that sort of power, and uh, very few of us do. All right. Well, thank you very much for joining us, Richard. Uh, again, the new book is The Yoga of Ghost Hunting. You can get it on yogaghost.com, and you can also get it on christarpress.com, and also pick up The Reincarnation of Abraham Lincoln. That's a great read as well. Richard, thanks so much, and we'll definitely have you back on sometime in the future to talk more about this. Thank you, Tim. It's been an absolute pleasure. All right. Have a good night. That is Richard Salva again. The Yoga of Ghost Hunting is the book. We'll be right back in just a few minutes. We're going to talk with Donna LaCroix about a new cause she's taken up, and we'll also kick around some other topics. There's some requests in the chat room to talk EVPs. We'll be right back with more here on Spooky South Coast. News, talk and first with local news, talk, and sports. This is WBSM New Bedford, Citadel Broadcasting, AM 1420, WBSM. From ABC News, I'm Chuck Sievertson. Stand down with Mubarak! In Atlanta, protests supporting the Egyptian anti-government demonstrations and calling for Egyptian President Mubarak to quit his 30-year rule. ABC's Alex Marquardt in Cairo. Buildings on fire in Cairo as a nationwide curfew is once again defied. A police station in Suez was torched. Looters broke into buildings in Cairo. They also broke into the world-famous Egypt Museum, breaking precious artifacts even reportedly tearing the heads off of ancient mummies. Citizens moved in to help protect the museum, forming a human chain around it. Police are nowhere to be seen as citizens do what they can to protect homes in several Egyptian cities. Mubarak's appointed a new prime minister and named his intelligence chief as his first ever vice president. Edward Walker, former UM, U.S. ambassador to Egypt. What they're doing is that they are setting up the scene for Mubarak to leave. And Mubarak never had a vice president for one reason, because he knew that if you have a vice president, somebody can take over. A head-on crash of a passenger train and a cargo train in eastern Germany has killed 10 people, including at least 33 others, eight seriously, according to local firefighters in Hordorf Village. Yeah, Several cars jumped the tracks. Rescue operations still underway. Cause of the crash is under investigation. The mother, who police say shot to death her teenage son and daughter in Tampa, Florida, because they were being mouthy, didn't appear in court today. Officials say Julie Schenecker is being treated for an undisclosed medical condition at a hospital. Laura McElroy with Tampa Police. It appeared that uh, the children never saw it coming. We don't believe that the children knew that their mother meant to harm them. The kid's father is an Army intelligence officer currently in Iraq. South Korea's Coast Guard says five Somali pirates captured during a raid on a hijacked cargo ship in the Arabian Sea have been brought to South Korea for trial. South Korean commandos stormed the ship and killed eight of the pirates, capturing the rest. You're listening to ABC News. Live from Progressive... So again, talking about something dear to my heart. Saving money. And we have Marcy. Hi, can I really find other car insurance companies' rates on Progressive.com? Sure can. It makes rate shopping fast and saving as easy as pie. Oh, it's got to be easier than that. Ever tried making a pecan pie? It can get soupy. Visit Progressive.com to compare rates and start saving today. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and its affiliates Mayfield Village, Ohio. Comparison rates not available in Massachusetts and certain other states or situations. Prices vary based on how you buy. Information is power. It's valuable. Mid-sized businesses rely on it. Because we are the engines of a smarter planet. We need data to be stored and secure. We need easy access to it. From anywhere, anytime. Introducing cloud-based backup, managed by IBM. It provides enterprise-level protection. Without the added costs. That's smarter business on a smarter planet. Services start at under $3 per user per month. Visit ibm.com backup. Prices are subject to change by IBM without notice. 
Every year, finance ministers, bankers, and leaders of industry gather in Davos, Switzerland to discuss the economy, but after the global financial meltdown, the meeting has taken on a greater urgency. Big wigs from banking, business, and government meeting in Davos are being asked to look into their crystal balls and forecast what's hoped will be sustained recovery. As for prospects in the U.S., World Bank President Robert Zellick is sounding cautiously optimistic. Some reasonable growth numbers, but still big challenge on uh, creating jobs. But Zellick warns a wave of debt and deficit still looms large. ABC's Linda Albin at our foreign desk in London. A day after Massey Energy rejected all federal government theories of what caused last year's coal mine explosion that killed 29 men, its rival Alpha Natural Resources says it has reached a deal to buy Massey for $7 billion in cash and stock. Going green to help erase some red ink is South Dakota City, says ABC's Joan Bennett. With many municipalities spinning their wheels, trying to figure out how to fill the hole in their budgets caused by serial snowstorms, the Yankton City Commission is considering how to approach a new state law that allows cities to regulate the use of golf carts on public streets. The options range from outlawing them, allowing them only near golf courses, or allowing unrestricted use. Some said the slow-moving carts would pose a safety hazard. Others said with rising gas prices, golf carts would be a cheaper form of transportation. And maybe they could be equipped with chains for winter. This is ABC News. Mortgages should be illegal because you're getting robbed every month. With a typical $200,000 30-year mortgage, you'll end up paying over $400,000 after interest. Hi, I'm John Commuta, creator of the Transforming Debt into Wealth System. My proven system can eliminate your mortgage and all your debts. Let me send you a powerful free CD for your free CD, call 1-800-618-4001. 1-800-618-4001. 1-800-618-4001. Chuck Sievertson, ABC News. I'm Jeff Gordon, warning parents about pertussis. What's that? Well, imagine a cough barreling through your infant's body <laughs> at up to 100 miles per hour <laughs> with enough force to make him gasp for air. <laughs> For weeks, even months. Pertussis, or whooping cough, is potentially fatal. Now imagine you gave this to your baby. Parents most often spread pertussis. And even when babies themselves are vaccinated, they're probably not protected till they've had at least three doses. I'm working with March of Dimes to urge you to help protect your baby by protecting yourself. Ask your health care provider about the adult pertussis vaccine. Because we can't stop pertussis fast enough. Learn more at soundsofpertussis.com. AM 1420, WBSM. Available anywhere and anytime at WBSM.com. Just one click gives you local news and weather, national and world news, business and entertainment news, and of course, sports. WBSM.com has the Pete Braley and Ken Pittman blogs, chances to save with half price hookup and iBid, and even ways to win. One click does it all from anywhere at any time. WBSM.com. I broke my neck in a diving accident over 40 years ago. People would approach my bedside in different ways. Hi, this is Johnny Erickson Tata, and some of my friends had a lot of good advice. But good as it was, their counsel went right over my head. Because I was too emotionally turned upside down to make heads or tails out of their well-meaning words. I'm sure the advice made great sense to them. And no doubt they were anxious to see a smile on my face or well, I guess want to see a happier nice. attitude from me. I was not ready for advice. I was still mourning. I was still grieving the loss of not having use of my hands or legs. I needed time to cry, time to think. And oh, how I appreciated those friends who did not come into my hospital to fix anything or fix me. Often they did not have any word to say. They just came to spend time with me. They cared. And from disabilitycampaign.org, let me say that you can care too. Hi, I'm Brett Michaels for the American Diabetes Association. Diabetes is a constant battle. I know, I've had it since I was six years old. 
A lot of people don't consider it deadly, but diabetes kills more Americans <laughs> each year than breast cancer and AIDS combined. Please join me in the movement to stop diabetes. Help us raise awareness and find a cure. Share, act, learn, and give at StopDiabetes.com. WBSM presents The Garden Guys, Sunday morning at 7. What to plant and when to plant it. Flowers, vegetable gardens, plants, and your lawn. Help for all your outdoor needs. The Garden Guys, Sunday mornings from 7 till 9 on AM 1420 WBSM. Hi, this is Scott Lang, Mayor of the City of New Bedford. Have you checked your medicine cabinet hey, lately? You should. Every day, more than 2,500 teenagers abuse prescription medication for the first time. Sadly, teens often experiment with medications they find right at home. Many young people think it's safer to misuse prescription medications than illegal street drugs, but that simply is not true. Prescription medications can be beneficial when used under a doctor's supervision, but misusing medications can lead to addiction, overdose, and even death. Fortunately, there are steps you can take to help protect your children. Keep track of your medications. Encourage friends and relatives to safeguard medications in their homes. And consult your pharmacist about disposing of medications you no longer need. Remember, prescription drug abuse is still drug abuse. If you don't want your children to abuse prescription medications, don't give them the opportunity. A community service of New Bedford, a partnership for a drug-free America and the U.S. Conference of Mayors. To learn more, go to drugfree.org. What if your brother or your husband, what if your son came back from the service with a spinal cord injury? When they volunteer to serve, we expect our country to be there for them if they are injured. For more than 60 years, Paralyzed Veterans of America has been fighting to ensure that we receive all of the benefits that we've earned. Thank you, Paralyzed Veterans, for helping my husband. My son. For helping my brother. You too can help. Visit pva.org, a public service of Paralyzed Veterans of America. We have to get on, we have to get on, we have so much time and so little to do. Strike that, reverse it. This way, please. Who's going to tell him? Oh, let's not wake him. We'll find out soon enough. Let him have one last. The spooky South Coast is back. No one is safe. Hold on tight. I'm not exactly sure what's going to happen. Welcome back. Hour number two of Spooky South Coast. Tim Weisberg here. Tim George Michael Weisberg here, along with uh, Andrew Ridgely, Matt Moniz. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I do know the other guy's name from Wham. I know, I know. But And also the silent assassin, Matt Costa, is here. Uh, he was not in Wham, but he's uh, better known from his days as Spinderella in Salt and Pepper. So <laughs> yeah. there you go. <laughs> we were just rocking out on Spooky TV during the news break there with uh, the little ukulele that I brought in and. Uh, we were playing George Michael's Faith, so we expect the letters to come in the mail real soon about that uh, little legal issue that we're bound to have now. And, of course, Chris Balzano's in the chair. I made to bring up my cease and desist letter from Dr. Dre. Thanks yeah. a lot for bringing that up. I was hoping that Dre had forgotten about it, you know, because I forgot about Dre. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Even Moniz, who doesn't listen to rap, is getting these jokes tonight, so... We are going to talk with Donna LaCroix in just a minute, but before we do that, since we're talking about legal issues and we're talking about hip-hop stars, there's uh, a really serious case that's come up, uh, a real serious legal case that's come up uh, with, a, with a good friend of the program, uh, and we're going to need you to make some donations to SpookySouthCoast.com so we can uh, kind of put this into the legal defense fund for this gentleman. I'm talking, of course, about none other than Sean P. Diddy. Puff Daddy, Diddy, Dirty Money, whatever, Combs. Uh, Diddy is in some legal trouble, and we'd like to help him out. Uh, let me just give everybody kind of the breakdown about this. Hip-hop mogul P. Diddy has been blamed for many crazy things over the years, but a new court filing takes it to a whole new level. This comes from Radar Online, where they actually have the court filing posted. A woman named Valerie Joyce Wilson Turks is seeking a restraining order against Diddy, whose real name, of course, is Sean Combs, accusing him of a whole plethora of wrongdoings. According, according to Turks, 
the 41-year-old Combs, along with his ex-girlfriend Kim Porter and LAPD brutality victim Rodney King, are responsible for the collapse of the World Trade Center, amongst other outrageous alleged atrocities. In the disturbing court documents, Turks claims that she dated Diddy and that the two have a son together, Cornelius Wilson, who is 23 years old. She, al she alleges that she's been subjected to abuse from Diddy from 2001 to 2010 and that, quote, Diddy went through Kim Porter and Rodney King and knocked down the World Trade Center and then they all came and knocked my children down, set me up on disability and disabled my baby. He put my baby in a wheelchair. Valerie then goes on to say in her statement, which is riddled with spelling and punctuation errors, he date raped me 24 years ago and knocked me down. Him and Kim Porter and Wallace Wright, then Sean Combs and Kim and Wallace Wright, came back 18 years later and raped and sexually abused my children and knocked my children down, crushed me and my children daily. Plus, I won a lot of money at the casino in Mississippi, and Sean P. Diddy Combs has my chip to my money. I heard he gave it to Gwen Allen to hold on to, but she could not cash it in. I want my chip. Please help me. It's worth well over $100 zillion and my hospital keys. <laughs> they put me and my baby in the hospital and broke my baby's two legs and sexually assaulted my children and crushed us. Valerie is requesting a cool $900 billion in child support. That's billion with a B. $900 billion in child support and $100 billion for loss of income. Uh, the judge who is trying this case <laughs> refused to issue a temporary restraining order but set a date for a hearing for this coming Monday, July 31st, 2011. So we need to <laughs> make sure that Diddy right. can defend himself because uh, $900 billion, uh, you know, nine, $900 billion in child support and $100 billion in loss of that's a trillion dollars. And not even bad boy has a trillion dollars in their bank account, I don't think. Did he get mixed up with my ex? <laughs> I don't know. Is that, was her name Valerie Joyce Wilson Turks? It could be now. So this woman <laughs> is suing Diddy for a, a trillion dollars, so he's going to need all the help he can get. So if you make a donation to SpookySouthCoast.com, right on the donate button on the front, please earmark it in the subject line or the, you know, the use line. Please put in there that it's f directly for the Diddy Defense Fund uh, because we need to raise $100 trillion as fast as we can. And uh, we'll also make sure that some of that money goes to Kim Porter and Rodney King as well, uh, since they've been also named in this case. But the, the fascinating thing about this isn't that this crazy woman actually filed this. It's the fact that it's going to have a hearing. Yes, let's waste more tax dollars. Oh, I can't wait to see the video from the courtroom on that one. All right. So now that we're talking about a case that is frivolous and stupid and... <laughs> Uh, chef in the chat room just writes, free Diddy. We're, gonna get some, we're, gonna, we're getting some t-shirts made up that say free Diddy. The guy gets in enough legal trouble on his own. Do we really need to start making up things and blaming the World Trade Center on him? Although I'm not exactly sure where he was that day. So just keep that in mind. Uh, the, the, you know, the notorious OBL is his new uh, rap protege. Anyway, we're, while we're talking about frivolous legal problems and everything, let's bring on our good friend Donna LaCroix. Uh, you know her from her work in the paranormal field with shows like Ghost Hunters and Ghost Hunters International. And she's going to be joining us to talk about a new cause she's taking up. Good evening, Donna. How are you tonight? I'm good. How are you guys doing? Oh, we are spooktacular. I mean, we're feeling a little bad for Diddy, but besides that. Man, I can't believe what's going on with Diddy. Who knew? How'd you guys know? You know, Charlie Sheen has been in the news lately, too, and he's the one that's been saying for years that 9-11 uh, was an inside job. And uh, he's, a, he's a good friend of Alex Jones, and you know he's been putting forth that conspiracy theory. So I wonder if he knows anything about this Diddy involvement. Yeah, I, I would detain that guy and ask him a few questions, because he's a little shady. You know what I mean? He's got a little shady past going on. What's, what's even more shocking to me in this whole thing is that Rodney King was involved. I mean, didn't he think we should all get along? <laughs> think that he's yeah i would think so we would think that right yeah but, but i guess you, not you know nothing surprises me anymore with the courts and the government nothing does um, nothing will ever shock me again things that go on well it, from what moniz was kind of filling me in on uh, prior to the show it sounds like uh, somebody who's a good friend of yours has uh, run into kind of a, a weird situation yeah, this is really, really crazy. Um, I lived in Japatit for the last three years, which is a little tiny town uh, bordering, like, western Rhode Island. And I lived in a neighborhood where everybody was super, super close. Um, just really great people. I was very fortunate to have nice neighbors. One of my neighbors, uh, his name is Tony, and he has a wife, Karen, and a little girl, Kaylee. Well, Tony came to this country about 
40 years ago when he was seven years old from Portugal. Best guy in the world. He's the kind of guy that, you know, when we first moved in, he was up our driveway, knocking on our door, asking us what he could do for us, if we needed anything. He was right there. I mean, he snow plowed for us. Uh, him and my now ex were like best friends. They did everything together. He helped us with the house. His wife was great. We, you know, spent the holidays with their family. They spent the holidays with us. Can't say more about him. So that's like the backstory. Well, what's really shocking to me as a U.S. citizen is about two weeks ago, Tony went to work probably about 7 in the morning, and he saw two black cars drive up with blackened-out windows, and a person comes out of the car and asks Tony if he is, you know, such and such, Tony such and such, and he says yes, and immediately they threw cuffs on him, threw him in these black cars, and off they went. Now his, you know, fellow employees are like, what the hell is going on? You know, what's happening? And they asked one of the guys in the other cars, and he just threw Tony's keys at him and said, hey, just give these to his wife. So needless to say, the employees and the boss, they were all just crazy worried, like, what is happening? Was he kidnapped? What, it was just a mob? So they called the state police, and finally they got some answers. Um, it actually was the U.S. Immigration and Customs Enforcement, which is nicknamed ICE, because they're pretty much cold as ice, which is a federal law enforcement agency under the U.S. Department of Homeland Security. And what they did was they took him up to a place in Dartmouth, Mass, where he is currently being detained. Now, they didn't notify his family. They didn't notify his friends. They didn't notify his but Nothing. You get no notification. And like I said, this guy has been... A great citizen. He's had his green card. He's always renewed his green card. Um, paid his state and federal taxes. Was a pillar of the community. And now freaking ICE is keeping him in a detention hall with 80 other immigrants. Uh, I can't even tell you how unbelievable the community is in terms of being outraged by this. Now, the only thing that uh, the guy did when he was 16, like, most of us, when we were younger, we we get little altercations or whatever. I mean, I used to uh, I used to jump the fence to the Sidhuet Reservoir and run, go fishing, and yeah, I'd be caught by the police, but they just you know released me. Everybody did that to go swimming in the reservoir. Well, a little bit different. Tony had was driving down the road, and a car pulled him to the side. It was a case of road rage, and it was just two seventeen-year-olds having a little fist fight. Well. They each press assault charges against the other. Now, mind you, this was 20 years ago. He did his probation. He's been a law-abiding citizen ever since. And with the immigration law of 1996, which stated that I believe they only go back in your records five years or so, now they've, they have turned it over such that you, they can go back in your records 20 years ago. I mean, there is a case actually where a man who's 52 here, who came here when he was two from Canada, had received st a stolen eight-track cassette tape. And now he's, he's going to be deported in a few days after 10 years of back and forth with ICE. It's just a, a crazy situation. I really want to reach out to everybody because I think the story needs to be told. You can't even begin to imagine the devastation that the federal government, ICE, has done to these families, and it's all because they're getting fed more and more money to work with state police to detain uh, what they call aliens, and, and Tony is an example, a poster boy of what they're trying to do. So it's not right. I really feel strongly about this, and I think more and more people should, you know, realize what our federal government is doing to people who have come to this country, paid their dues making a difference in our society rather than those sexual offenders and murderers that get out of jail and come back into society and then are a menace. I mean, come on now. So, you know, needless to say, I feel really strongly about this issue, and I am holding a benefit for Tony and his family. It's going to be next Saturday night. It is going to be in Japan, Rhode Island. I'll have directions and times and 
um, all that good stuff up on my Facebook page. And we're holding a raffle. Um, everybody and everybody that knows Tony, which he knows everybody, is donating things. A uh, band is flying in for the occasion. We've got people donating, you know, John Deere tractors, which out in Japan it is like gold. <laughs> <laughs> Um, you know, I'm donating a lot of money. I'm raising money at work. I'm talking to whoever I can talk to. I'm trying to get appointments with the senators, uh, governor. I'm writing letters. I'm sending emails. I'm doing everything I can. And, uh, you know, all I ask is, you know, maybe those of you who are out there listening, just visit my Facebook page uh, during the week. Um, I should have everything up there by Tuesday, Wednesday, so check back. And, uh you know, if you want to make a, a donation, whether it be 25 cents or 75 cents, I should have, like, a PayPal thing going on up there. And um, in the return, I'll, you know, I'll send you a, an autographed picture if you'd like. I mean, I'm just trying to, you know, do everything I can to reach people. And uh, I really hope that this doesn't happen to anybody out there that you guys know because it's, uh, it's an unthinkable disgusting thing that our federal government is doing. And I hate to sound like an unappreciative American, but shit, I pay my taxes. You know, I have friends and neighbors who do the same thing. They're good people. They don't deserve this. So um, I feel very strongly about it. Well, Donna, can I make one other suggestion? Yeah. Put the name, address, and email address of the local senators, governor, and whoever else you you know in the federal government that think that they should that you think that they should receive a letter from the people that visit your site power okay. and numbers not just money you have other people that come to your site making a complaint to your government this is the american um system at work let's yeah. use our power yeah and it's, it's being abused it's being used wrongly and another thing i want to add is that these Chinese are in like deplorable conditions. I mean, there's 60, 80 of them, and uh, my friend, the friend that's in there, his wife went to go see him, and man, he's just, you know, he used to be the life of the party. He used to have all, you know, be the positive reinforcement. He would let you cry on his shoulder. Just, just a great. He has no spark, no spirit in his eyes. He, he looks defeated, and I just want to do do something to like give him a little bit of hope. And it's family hope because we're talking about a family that's being destroyed, and it's just not fair. Uh, so, a, you know, that's a great idea, Matt. I will. I'll put on my site um, the, you know, the senators that can be written to, the governor. I mean, even Obama in his State of the Union speech that I watched the other night had touched on deportation, but they he touched on deportation as far as, Students in the United States get an education here and then being sent back to the country and then, you know, um, kind of like, you know, working against us. But uh, I'd like to write to Obama to encourage him, invite him to think about the other type of people that are getting deported. Well, this is a case of where in ICE's situation here, they're grabbing what's known as low-hanging fruit, the easy pickings, people that aren't really a threat rather than going after, you know, the illegals that are uh, coming here with carrying drugs and everything else. It's much easier to get rid of the people that aren't really going to cause you any undue um, aggravation, whereas in the other people, that if they're going after them, that, that involves risk because these other illegal people that should be deported and getting gotten rid of out of this country... I'm talking the drug dealers and, you know, the people causing, you know, problems, not necessarily migrant workers coming no, you're to right. try to make you a know, living, you, but you know what that, I mean. Yeah, Get rid of the scumbags. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, and if you want to, when you do send out that information, just uh, send me a message with it, and I'll make sure that I put it up there, too, and uh, we'll get uh, all of our friends in the paranormal community to keep reposting it. And it just shows that, you know, when somebody is a good person, no matter what the situation you know, you want to be able to count on your neighbors to, to come to your help and to come to your aid. And it definitely sounds like uh, Tony's somebody who has earned that respect and that love from the community. Oh, yeah. Yeah, That I mean, that, you know, I appreciate it. I really would. Um, I was just looking at a comment uh, that Miss just put. She 
visa, so a legal immigrant can be deported for a misdemeanor. Absolutely. Um, I'm talking even if you just a juvenile you know, stop, at that. Stop, yeah, stop lifting. Forget it. Bam, you're out. You're out of here, and, and that's not right. And uh, I think Low Battery Dave had written something about did he pay all his taxes? Yes, he paid all his taxes, my friend, all his state and federal taxes. This isn't somebody who dodges the bullet. And like Matt said, he's being used as an example because he is an easy target. Um, you know, so it's just, it's a, it's a tragedy. It, it disgusts me to no end. And, you know, it's a personal friend of mine, so obviously I feel very strongly about it. But, you know, I have talked to a lot of immigrants that I work with. I work in a place where there's over 40 immigrants. And I had a meeting the other day, and we, we talked and discussed the subject, and a lot of them were not aware about how the 1996 law was re, uh, revoked to go back in someone's record, you know, more than 15 years. So, uh, you know, for anybody out there who has people that have become, uh, you know, hold a green card, the lawful residents here, you might want to just kind of fill them in on this because they're really cracking down now. Well, I'll tell you this much, too. Anybody that makes a Diddy Defense Fund donation on SpookySouthCoast.com, we're going to forward on to you for Tony. So <laughs> I, don't think, you. I don't think anybody's going to do that because <laughs> I think it's pretty clear that we were kidding around there. But absolutely, uh, when you have all the information up there, let us know. And if, if there's any lawyers out there who are listening to the program, I do know that there are a few who have gotten in touch with me. Yeah. And I do think one of them mentioned to me in the past that he worked with immigration. So hopefully, if he's listening, he can get in touch with me and get, give I've me some contact info. I've got a ghost friend in New York that works in immigration. And we'll too. forward uh, the information on to Donna, and she can help uh, help Tony in that regard too. So, so next I really, I really appreciate it. I, you know, I, I, any anything would help. And I know there, you know, people on chat board that are kind of like on the fence about it, but uh, you know, I encourage you guys to go and look into the laws and um, and, and look at what's happening out there because. There's a lot of stuff to take in, and, you know, I know a lot of Americans have resentment about immigrants coming over here, um, but there's this whole other side of the story. And, uh, you know, I, I just want to thank you two for having me on the show, and I, I certainly will update my Facebook page so people can check in, read it, and if they want to come to the event, I would more be more than happy to see everybody. But it's, it's next Saturday night, you said? Yep, it's next Saturday. It's at a bar and grill called Char's, that's C-H-A-R-S. And uh, we're going to have live music, we're going to have a band, we're going to have a DJ. Um, you know, they, it, you know, kids are welcome to bring your kids along. It's going to be pretty educational, but in, in celebration of trying to get this overturned. You know, like really just coming together with prayer and, and the power of his friends is just rooting for him. I sense a live remote. I think I'll be reporting from in the field next well, week. <laughs> you can certainly go on our yeah, behalf. Yeah, Matt. Uh, if you don't come, I'm going to come out there and kidnap you because, you know, I'm not that far away, you know. No, you, true. you, you can take him. You need a sound man I'll for the night? Him. I'll drive him down. <laughs> awesome. Well, I thank you guys so much for giving me this little like, time to kind of, you know, tell my little story here. It's really great that you guys did that, and I love your show, and I, I love the fact that I can see you guys and Matt, the goatee. You wear <laughs> well, man. Thank you. He's getting a little bushy there, but that's all right. He, he lo looks good. He, compared with Obama, he doesn't mind being a little bushy. So. <laughs> all right. Well, we'll, we'll let you get uh, back to planning everything for that, and please keep us up to date with everything that goes on. Hopefully things work out great for Tony and his family. Thank you so much, guys. Have a great night. Thank love you, you hon. All right, love you too. Bye-bye now. Bye. That is Donna LaCroix. And again, next Saturday night, that'll be the event. She's going to put it up on Facebook, and we'll forward it out on our Facebooks as well. Um, we'll tweet it. We'll do everything we need to do to make sure people know about it. Um, no matter what you feel about the immigration issue, and I know in this area, the south coast of Massachusetts, it's a, it's a huge hot-button issue with what happened uh, in the factory here in New Bedford uh, about a year and a half ago, I think. And it, it's definitely something that is always talked about here on the WBSM airwaves. So maybe that this particular case can be brought up uh, during some of the daytime programming here on WBSM. Uh, I know Ken Pittman's show, they deal with that topic quite a bit. And uh, there's people that listen to that show that know about this issue. Uh, find out more about this particular case and more about the immigration in general. And at, at the very least, you know, if, if 
you have a few dollars that you're going to make a Super Bowl bet with, you're not going to win anyway. You know, you're going to end up making a stupid bet with it. Use that money to a good cause and donate it as part of uh, Donna's event next week. All right, why don't we take a break? When we come back, uh, as promised, we'll take a look at the idea of EVPs as discussed in the chat room. But for those of you in the chat room who were talking about it, don't be content with just standing there and typing. Call in 1-877-996-1420. 508-996-0500. Those are the numbers. We'll talk about electronic voice phenomena, especially how it relates to the upcoming event we're doing February 26th at the Lizzie Boyd and Ben and Breakfast. So stay tuned. We'll be right back with more here on Spooky South Coast. The WBSM Mobile Text Club can make your busy life so much easier and so much more fun. But are you a member? Do you get daily updates of headlines, sports scores, political events, even your daily horoscope and trivia? Well, if not, join now. Log on to WBSM.com. Simply click the WBSM mobile button near the top of the screen and get started. It only takes a minute. Sign up, choose your favorites from a big variety of updates, and then the free content is delivered to your phone. We'll never send you mobile messages you didn't ask for, and you can opt out at any time by going online or using your phone. Don't be left in the dark. Sign up now for the Mobile Club from AM 1420 WBSM. For America's wounded warriors, coming home can sometimes be a battle in itself. Making the transition back to civilian life or active duty with a traumatic injury can be the challenge of a lifetime. The USO provides every American a way to support our wounded warriors and their families through every phase of their medical treatment and rehabilitation. It's how all of us, as a community, can give something back to our heroes. It's how we can say thank you and assure them that their sacrifice is recognized and appreciated by every one of us. Join us. Visit USO.org to learn how you can make a difference in the lives of our wounded warriors and their families. The USO, until everyone comes home. When winter weather hits, turn to AM 1420 WBSM or WBSM.com. The WBSM Storm Center will get you through whatever Mother Nature dishes out. Closings and cancellations, the latest AccuWeather forecast, and up-to-the-minute road reports from Gem Traffic. The WBSM Storm Center, brought to you by Irving Oil, ABC Disposal Service, and Fall River Ford. Power through the winter with the Storm Center, with the help of WBSM.com and AM 1420 WBSM. When you think of the reasons people end up in the ER, you probably wouldn't think of West Nile virus from mosquitoes, asthma attacks from cockroaches, hantavirus from rodents, or Lyme disease from ticks, even bites from fire ants and other stinging insects send half a million people here every year. But you could make a difference in helping to protect your family from pest-related illnesses. Go to pestworld.org to learn how. Why wait until there's an emergency? <laughs> Bring it, Ranberry. Spooky South Coast is back. Lean forward slightly. Look straight at the speaker and listen with a sparkle in your eye, as though you might be thinking, gee, this is the most wonderful thing I've ever heard in all my life. All right, welcome back to Spooky South Coast. Tim Weisberg here, along with the silent assassin Matt Costa and science advisor Matt Moniz, broadcasting on WBSM and also on Spooky TV at SpookySouthCoast.com, where we have a chat room going on while the show is live, where people can discuss things going on during the program. And right now we have some Randolph versus Avon smack talk, some uh, suggestions for EVP, the band, not the uh, paranormal phenomena, but the uh, the actual band. Uh, some good ukulele chat going on tonight. 
And uh, also, you know, just general camaraderie in there. So be sure to check it out. You can also see the on-demand video archives anytime by going to SpookySouthCoast.com and clicking on the TV link. And you can also go to Ustream.com, which is the service we use to broadcast this. And, of course, the podcasts are available every possible place where you could ever find them, including iTunes, Zoom Marketplace, and the Stitcher service. If you have a smartphone, get the Stitcher service at Stitcher.com. And you can automatically get the podcasts as they're updated. You can get the latest show uh, every week as we put it up there. And I'm trying to think of what else we need to promote. Hmm, is there anything else that we're doing that's going? Oh, that's right. Dead of Winter is coming up February 26th at the Lizzie Board and Bed and Breakfast. Now, when we started off, there was only 25 tickets for sale uh, because the Lizzie Board and Bed and Breakfast is small. And we want to make sure that we don't pack it with too many people. There were only 25 tickets available for this event. by the time, And that was, I think we announced that on Thursday of last week. By the time we hit the airwaves on Saturday night, there were only 16 spots left. And now here we are a week later. There's only nine spots left, and all the rooms are gone. All the rooms have been rented out. So if you want to get involved with this, you better act really soon. If you go to ghostvillage.com backslash Lizzie, L-I-Z-Z-I-E, you can find out more. Uh, the menu's up there for the dinner that Matt Costa and I are going to cook. And by Matt Costa and I, I mean mostly Matt Costa while I suggest things to him, right? Yeah. Uh, I'm, not su- I'm not food safe certified right now. I think my, my food safe certification is, uh, is uh, in the expiration period. But uh, I'm sure it's fine. Yeah. <laughs> as long as I don't cough in anything, I should be all right. And uh, we're going to prepare the meal for everyone. We're going to have some lectures. We're going to have uh, an investigation, a live broadcast of Spooky South Coast from the Lizzie Boyd and Ben and Breakfast while it's going on. Uh, but the other thing that has me so excited is we're going to be debuting Bill Chapel's Spiricom device. Now, uh, it's been seen a few times out in the field. I think they use it on the Queen Mary for something. Uh, but we're going to be bringing it here to the East Coast for the first time. Jeff Belanger. Uh, who is putting on this event with us from Ghost Village and from his many books. You know him, you love him. He's the host of 30-odd minutes. He's actually going to be bringing in the Spiritcom that Bill Chapel has, in, I don't want to say invented, but we'll say... Reinvented? Reinvented, perfected. Uh, he's taking the original Spiritcom device developed by George Meek in the, in the 70s, and he's made it the size of a suitcase. And there's a lot of controversy about the Spiritcom device, and we're going to talk about that next week. Jeff's going to be our guest in the second hour. In the first hour, we're going to talk with Michael Clarkson about his new book on poltergeists, which I'm reading now. And it's, it's a great story, not only about poltergeist phenomena, but it gives lots of case examples, some of which we've talked about on the show before, some of which we've never discussed on the program. So it's going to be a, a great hour for me because I'm fascinated by the topic of poltergeist. But as I said, in hour two, Jeff Belanger will talk with us about the Spiritcom and about... Uh, we're hoping to get Bill Chapel to come on and talk about some of the improvements he's made over Meek's original design because there is a lot of controversy over the original device. And we'll get into all of that. Uh, you know, Bill O'Neill was a, a psychically gifted man who worked with Meek in the spirit, with the Spiritcom. And there's some, I don't know, some allegations about Bill O'Neill that we can talk about next week. Uh, but for now, you know... It was asked in the chat room if we could discuss EVP a little bit, and I'm all for that. I mean, I'll talk about EVPs all day long. Not, And I'm not talking about our band, as great as we were that one time. Hopefully more coming. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, <laughs> we um, – see, I, I don't really know how to combine – the idea of what we do today in the terms of instrumental transcommunication with the idea of the Spiritcom, because I know that that's kind of like the grandfather of a lot of these devices that we use, uh, but that was kind of invented for that purpose. And what most of the community is using are devices that were not invented for that purpose, that were modified for that purpose. Uh, and I know that Bill Chapel and guys like him are building some more specific devices nowadays, but it seems like everything we're using is a hacked version of something else, whereas the Spiritcom was kind of built for this purpose. And I, I haven't read the book, um, Ghost of 26 Megacycles. I've, I don't know the real ins and outs of it. I've seen the user guide for the Spiritcom online. I'm sure you've heard some of the old recordings. I've heard today. a lot of the old recordings. Uh, and Dr. Stephen Rourke, who has been one of the leading proponents of, of the 
idea that it's a hoax uh, is somebody that ho hopefully maybe we can get Dr. Rourke to even come on for a few minutes next week. And I don't want to bring in the controversy and the problems with Meek's Spiritcom and tie that into Bill Chappell's Spiritcom because this is two different devices. And if Jeff Belanger tells me that something works, I believe Jeff Belanger. Uh, but I don't know. It it's definitely something that we'll get into more in depth next week. So for now, we can keep it more to you know, the modern idea of EVPs. And I've thrown out the phone numbers before, but I'll do it again. 1-877-996-1420. 508-996-0500. And Moniz, we've been involved in a number of investigations where EVPs have been the most predominant form of evidence that we've captured. Yes. It's almost to the point where it seems like we can go somewhere and we'll get something if we run tape. And I wonder how All much... It depends upon who's with us. I've noticed that. Uh, yes. I'm talking about people with us. Mm -hmm. The right people, yeah, we'll get reams of stuff. And other times where it's just a handful or certain other people are there, we get nothing. Well, it seems too like uh, we've been at a variety of different spots where we've had this happen. It hasn't been limited to like, okay, here's an EVP hotspot. And we know that if we go there, we're going to get a lot. It seems like wherever we go, we can get a lot. And especially when we've taken Mike Markowitz with us and his equipment. I mean, that's a guaranteed bonanza of EVPs. Is it becoming more like... Oh, I almost wonder if they're starting to become like orb photographs, you know, where people are just easily dismissing them because it's it's happening so much as we're getting better equipment to be able to record these. Uh, people are taking it kind of in stride. They're saying, OK, yeah, I hear that, but it's still not enough for me. Whereas five years ago, an EVP might have been enough to knock somebody on their ass. Yeah. It, it, do you think that? I mean, do you see that happening? Do you see that people are becoming almost, eh, I don't want to say immune, but kind of less bowled over by EVPs. Are, are they becoming jaded? Is that, the, is that what you're saying? Or um... Not jaded, but just a matter of, okay, yep, so you got that voice. You know, they just, they don't, there's no explanation as to why it happened, but it's just, it's, it's not enough anymore. And I can tell you that when I heard my first one, I was like, holy. Yeah, I was there. <laughs> so like, na <laughs> you know, but now it's more like, okay, yep, we got those. All right. It's almost like there's a checklist of things that you need to get now when you go on, on an investigation. All right. EVP, check that one off. We're all set. Well, um, they're always nice to get. Yes. But for me, the EVPs, uh, it's, it's one of those, yeah, you're, you're grateful to have it. And you're always looking for the message that they're trying to get get across. But you're right. When you try and show it to somebody else, without them having been there to see what you went through to get it, mm -hmm. to them it's just a, a, a faint voice or part of a word that they hear on a recorder. So to them it's like, so what? And, and Miss, Miss Jess in the chat room brings up a good point. Uh, you know, she wants to know how much of it is just hearing things in – the the noise hearing things in the the static and uh, it's, yeah. uh, it all depends upon the quality like i said good class a evp there's like we've gotten several of them where there's no question what mm -hmm. what is being said i mean especially to you at the lizzie borden house a little, well yeah <laughs> a little bit of uh, a little bit of breaking down the wall here but you know we have a number of groups that want to come on the show all the time and and People who say, hey, you know, I, I, we have a group. We've got a lot of evidence. We've got a lot of EVPs. We'd love to have come on the show and talk about them. And I don't know. Things are kind of different than they were when we started this show. Oh, this is our anniversary week, by the way, guys. Happy anniversary. Six years? Yeah. Uh, no, 2000, since 2006, so five years, right? No, I thought it was six years. I don't know. We're going into season year six. Yeah. Okay. So but we went on the air uh, January twenty eighth, two thousand six. So happy anniversary! Happy anniversary to all the all the uh, listeners. And um, so when we first started the show, you know, we were getting a lot of people that wanted to come on, and uh, you know, share their evidence with us. And we would say, "Sorry, send it to us. Send us what you have." And we'd listen to the clips, and it was kind of like. All right, I can kind of hear what they're saying. And, you know, and back then, that might have been good enough to, to impress us. But now it's not the case anymore. Now it needs to be something really clear and loud and, and easily distinguishable. And 
we're getting that. That's what we're getting from people out in the field now. It's not the same. There are a lot of groups out there who are saying, okay, here's our audio evidence. And when you listen to it, it's like, eh, maybe. I can see where you're going with that, but I really just think it was the sound of a car driving by. I wasn't there. I can't say one way or another that it definitely was that, but that's what it sounds like to me. And it's just, to me, you have to have it be almost smack you right in the face, which I know I can speak firsthand. It does happen. <laughs> no, not literally getting smacked in the face, but hearing, well, that does too, but... hearing an audio clip that is that powerful. Um, so that, I mean, that would be my suggestion to somebody like Miss Jess, who is contemplating the idea of doing some EVP work. And uh, Chris is in the chat room. Our content director, Chris Balzano, mentioned Karen Mossy and trying to get her on the show. Did I just hit the wrong button? Uh, trying to get her on the show. And uh, I have I think I sent out feelers to her once about coming on. I've seen her speak on a number of occasions. We both have, yeah. She is an amazing researcher, and she does some really interesting stuff. And I know she's somebody that Mike Markowitz works closely with and, and is inspired from and learns from. So uh, when you ask me the question, why haven't we had her on the show, I ask you the question as being the content director, why haven't we had her on the show? <laughs> So there you go. All right, well, we have a call here. Let's go to the phones. Good evening. You are on Spooky South Coast. How are you doing? Hey, how are you doing, guys? Hey, how's it going? Oh, not too bad. You knew you couldn't talk about EVPs without hearing from me. Well, here's the person who captured <laughs> some of the EVPs that we're talking about. <laughs> and there's also, uh, can we can we let the cat out of the bag a little bit? Can we say about the project that you're working on? Uh, sure, go ahead. She's working on her first book about EVPs. It's been fun, too, I must <laughs> Although your ears must be bleeding from all the uh, tapes oh, you've had to listen God. to. Oh, God, yeah. I'm, I have to stuff cotton balls in my ears nowadays, I'm telling you. Well, um, uh, it, it's... I, I, I was kind of interested in what Jen, uh, well, Miss Jess said, I should say, on uh, in the chat room about, you know, some of these things you can't hear. And, and it is true, you know, and a lot of those we, we do throw away. I, I particularly am going for... Um, things that are very clear, you know, and I, I do kind of have supersonic ears, so to me, things that are clear for me aren't clear for others. That's been like a huge testing part of the book, too, It's having actual humans come to my house and listen to the stuff and, and tell me if they can hear them. But I'm going to cut you off there for a second, and I, I don't want to take this onto a tangent, but I just want to point out, and this can be a discussion for another time, but I think some of that hearing ability, it might not just be the physical ability of your ear to perceive that sound but it might be a spiritual connection for you knowing you and 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 knowing how spirits are drawn to you but anyway go ahead well that makes sense because a lot of people have actually said that to me you know because i can take um for instance um eric uh, from dart and dartmouth i know you're familiar with eric lavoy mm -hmm. um he had gotten a couple of evps at the west house um you know we've been in to investigate there a few times now um, I got some great stuff out of that place that still has my head spinning. But, <laughs> you know, Eric had decided that he felt like he needed to go in the basement. And he got a couple of EVPs down there. Now, he actually had Mike Markowitz work these over, and he sent them over to me because he knew that the West House is part of, you know, my book. Um, and now I'm listening to these, and, and the first one, he had thought that it says, I'm something about like on being a stripper. Now, yeah. when I listen to these, I actually hear the ship's river, you know, and to me, I'm pretty much really sure that it says that. And now this same female voice in another EVP that I would consider probably like a class C, it's, it's very soft. They thought that it said something like come down and then cut, like, you know, cut someone with a knife or something. Now, I hear that, and I, I really think that this, this ghost is kind of flirting with Eric because it says, come down, baby, come. You know, No, it's, I'm sorry, I said that wrong. It's take it down, baby, come. You know, and, and to me, like, I'm picking these things up, and I'm saying, now, I know Mike Markowitz is really good, but, you know, that's more of what I'm getting out of that. And I kind of giggled. I've been teasing poor Eric about it that, you know, and his wife loves it. She's like, well, if she's a stripper, she can bring home the tips. I don't mind. She can have them as long as she's bringing me home the tips. She's, she's a great lady, too. But, you know, some of these things, you know, a lot of people have said that. And 
I do think someone a little more spiritually connected is going to hear these better than someone who's never had a, a, an experience or worked in the field or anything like that. And that's a difficult part of even working these EVPs out because I want just anyone out there who's maybe dreamed about investigating or is just interested in the field to be able to, you know, put the put these on on and sit there and listen and go, wow, this is great and, and enjoy it. You know, because that that's the funny thing about it is, you know, I enjoy ghost hunting. I enjoy when I get, you know, an E V P that blows my mind or makes me laugh or, you know, something like that because I do have to admit I've got a lot of E V Ps that actually made me laugh when when I hear what they're saying to us, you know, um, another one from the West House, they, they found some some excrement inside the attic, and we were a little worried because we were like, oh, geez, maybe they've got pests or rats or squirrels or something coming in the house. And in the other room, Renee and, and Eric are actually talking about the excrement, and Tara and I are in, in another room at this point. And the ghost actually says, oh, geez, they say a rat. So... You know, that kind of cracks me up. In the afterlife, these ghosts are still afraid of rats. You know, little things like that. Well, one one thing I want to ask you, and we've only got about three minutes left, but uh, as you mentioned, Miss Jess in the chat room was asking some questions about EVP, and one of them was she was concerned about whether or not to conduct sessions in her own home because she doesn't want to know if there are spirits there. And as somebody who I know has had spirits in their house on numerous occasions, what are your thoughts on the idea of at least, I don't know, practicing EVP at home or, or getting familiar with it uh, in a place that you're comfortable and you know all the different sounds of? Hmm. That's, that's a hard, tough question because they do go both ways. Some people don't believe that you should do any of that because then you're bringing it in. Um, every time we go on investigation, we are inviting it in. Um, if, if it were something where, you know, you think you've got some activity in your house, I, I think, you know, it's safe to a point, but... You should always think about protections, you know, and protections for everyone is different depending on their spiritual beliefs. To me, I can smudge my house. I can make a circle of salt. I can tell those things to go away because I feel like I have that power in a way because I've been in this field so long and, and I hold a lot of spiritual beliefs. For someone else, they might want to go and be blessed by a priest, have some holy water, and then try it, you know, but if, if there's any, like, feeling of being uncomfortable, then I don't think it's a good idea for someone who feels uncomfortable already. You know, if you feel comfortable about it, you give yourself some protections, you protect your house, you only specifically invite good spirits in. You know, even looking on the Wampanoag aspect, when, when you go to a feast with the Wampanoags, they invite the good spirits spirits to come. They invite the spirits of the elders. They ask them for guidance. They ask them for protection. So here's a feast and you're inviting ghosts in. If that makes any sense to you, oh. I feel it's like that that protection thing and that feeling comfortable with it and asking for only good spirits, you know. And and the other thing is you don't have to do it in your house. Just go to another place you're familiar with That's and right. try to you know what would be a great place to do it is take it to the library. Yep. Because, hey, most libraries I've been in are haunted. Yep. So, uh, all right. Well, thank you for checking in. We're about out of time. Um, but hopefully if Miss Jess has any more questions, she can get in touch with you. You're always on the uh, SpookySouthCoast.com forum uh, as an Eagles angel if she wants to get a hold of you there and ask you some more questions, right? Oh, anytime. I'm, I'm always willing to help people out. You know, when you And can... you learn more. The, the, I love the go between with that, you know, where you see other people's opinions. And sometimes it really sets you to think to start these discussions and, and explorations with people. And, of course, you know, that's when you take a few minutes away from working on the book. That's right. i got to <laughs> take a few minutes every now and then to, you know, definitely take some breaks here and there or my ears would be bleeding. Hearing how, much, me. hearing how much work you put into this book makes me really ashamed. <laughs> for Ghosts of the South Coast. Well, but. I'll tell you, the, it's mostly the EVPs. I mean, I, I do want to have a very um, a solid book because I, I do think that I was meant to write, you know, because it does, a lot of times it just kind of flows right out of me, and afterwards I'm like, wow, I wrote that. <laughs> you know, what <laughs> happened there, you know? So I think it was kind of meant to be, and I, I want it to be prepared well, and I want everyone to be able to enjoy those EVPs. And I think that they will. 
I hope so. I guess we'll just have to wait and see what happens. All right. Well, thank you very much. And uh, all right, now get back to writing. All right. You guys have a great night. <laughs> you too. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. That is Luann from Wailing City Ghosts. And uh, if you want to discuss it with her, again, as I mentioned, she's on the SpookySouthCoast.com forum as an Eagles Angel. She's one of the moderators over there. And she's probably the most pleasant person on those boards. And uh, so definitely get in touch with her if you have any more questions. And, uh, yeah, thanks, Mark. He said he finished my book in two days. Chris and I talk all the time. You know, when people say, oh, I read your book in one day. I couldn't put it down. It's not always a compliment necessarily, but, hey, when you're limited to 125 pages. I read Richard Salva's book in a day because it was just that fascinating to me. So, All right, well, uh, Miss Jess wants to know how sales are of the book. And I'll tell you what. They could always be better. So just go to SpookySouthCoast.com and go to the store, and you'll find the link to purchase your copy of Ghosts of the South Coast. I also have some always in the car with me, too. And we're going to have some at Dead of Winter on February 26th, so make sure you come check that out. We are just about out of time. Again, though, if you want to get tickets to that, there's only nine left. So <laughs> make sure – thanks, Chris. Make sure that you uh, sign up early and often. Buy those nine tickets up and share amongst your friends. $125. Uh, for the event only tickets because all the rooms are sold out so that's the only price package left we'll be back next week in the first hour to talk poltergeist with michael clarkson and we'll talk in the second hour with jeff belanger about spiritcom both the original and the new one devised by bill chapel and how we'll put that to use at the lizzie board and bed and breakfast at dead of winter on february 26th so until next week for matt costa for matt moniz for chris balzano i'm tim weisberg we want you all to stay spooktacular The latest news, weather, and sports, and stimulating talk. AM 1420, WBSM. First with local news, talk, and sports. This is WBSM New Bedford, Citadel Broadcasting. AM 1420, WBSM. From ABC News, I'm Hillary Barsky. Egypt's capital is descending further into chaos after days of anti-government protests, killing more than 70 people. Thousands have defied curfews, rejecting the ruler's promises of reform and a new government. President Hosni Mubarak is the target of public anger across Egypt. Protests continued through the weekend, calling for a regime change. On Friday night, Mubarak bent, dismissing his cabinet and promising a better political and economic way of life. But Egypt doesn't seem convinced. More than half the population lives under the poverty line on less than $2 a day. Many more are frustrated by unemployment and rising expenses. As protesters crowded the streets on Saturday, they told us they blame Mubarak and they want to see him go. Lara Satrakian, ABC News, Cairo. There's an additional concern here in the States that anti-government sentiment in Egypt will affect our economy. Here's more from ABC's David Curley. Some markets may be rocked, including commodities and the oil markets. In fact, on Friday, stocks in tanker companies, oil tankers, went up with fear that the Suez Canal might be shut down. The hope is that long-term markets will steady. An army officer's wife described as being depressed has been charged with first-degree murder in the shooting deaths of her two teenagers in Florida. Police in Tampa say Julie Scheneker shot them Thursday night because they were too mouthy. More from ABC's Chris Martinez. 13-year-old Bo was first, shot twice in the head in a van on the way to soccer practice. Then 16-year-old Calix, killed while doing homework on her computer, shot once in the back of the head and once in the face. Massey Energy struggling with losses after an explosion that killed 29 workers at a West Virginia coal mine last spring agreed to be taken over by Alpha Natural Resources. At least 10 people are dead and dozens injured, many of them severely after a head-on train crash late Saturday in eastern Germany. You're listening to ABC News. Who's watching your home when you're not there? It could be a burglar. Burglars prefer to break in when they think no one is home and no one will stop them. But now you can get a free security system monitored by ADT, the leader in home security. Pick up your phone now and get free hardware, free medical and fire alert, and free activation. It's an $850 value. Just call Protect Your Home, your authorized ADT dealer. You'll get 24-hour protection and no charge for parts or activation. Call now about a free security system monitored by ADT. 
Call 1-888-987-3232. That's 1-888-987-3232. $99 installation charge, 36-month monitoring agreement at $35.99 per month. Total amount $12.95.64. Call for terms and conditions to this offer and protect your home license numbers. Call now, 1-888-987-3232. That's 1-888-987-3232. It may be tough to find work these days unless you're banking on a career in the adult entertainment industry. Need a job? Head to Dallas. But only women need apply for this one. And you should know up front, you're going to have to bear more than just your soul to get it. The city is facing a critical shortage of strippers or exotic dancers, if you prefer. Big D's Triple X clubs are hoping to hire about 10,000 pronto. You see, the Super Bowl is coming up, and that means a lot of guys are heading to town. The entertainment website TMZ.com suggests a 30 to 1 client to dancer ratio is ideal. Better send a picture with that resume. Daria Albinger, ABC News. It was the biggest profit for Ford in a decade, the automaker announced on Friday. Over $6.5 billion in earnings for 2010. That means hourly employees will get about $5,000 each in profit sharing checks this month. These Wayne, Michigan employees already know how they're going to spend the cash. Right now I'm trying to make a savings because I don't know where we're going to be later. So right now I'm just wanting to save, having an account. I'm going to pay off some bills that I've added up over the years. Comcast, the nation's largest cable TV company, took control of NBC Universal after the government shackled its behavior in the coming years to protect online video services such as Netflix and Hulu. The takeover gave Comcast 51% control of NBC Universal, which owns NBC. This is ABC News. I looked at her and I was just, wow, she looked so young. How are ordinary women across America looking years younger? They've discovered the proven breakthrough called hydroxetone. It erases wrinkles, tightens skin, and makes frown lines disappear from view. See for yourself by requesting a risk-free trial today. She always looked good to me. I can't believe how young she looks. Hydroxetone is now available at Ulta stores, but for this exclusive...